Want an edge for betting the Super Bowl? Click the link in the description to download VSIN's free betting guide. We're joined in studio there at the D by Scott Spritzer, professional handicapper, Doc Sports, and Scott Wins on Twitter. Prop betting has become very popular, as you know. In fact, I would, I would dare say the new generation starts with props, and then they start hitting the side in total. But as far as the incubation or the beginning of prop betting, you actually know the prop that started it all. The biggest prop that got this whole ball rolling was the Chicago Bears Super Bowl win when Chuck Esposito, who I'm sure you guys know well, Chuck Esposito, who's over at the Red Rock Station now, I think his boss at the time at the Westgate, which was then the Las Vegas Hilton, was Art Manteras, if I remember correctly. But Chuck Esposito, who was a Chicago native, uh, they put up the prop on will the fridge, William Refrigerator Perry, score a touchdown or not because he had gotten a couple of carries throughout the course of the season and it became a real popular deal. That was the prop that got the ball rolling. And Esposito was interviewed by everybody back then around the country about this prop. Wow, what's a Super Bowl prop? And that's when it really kicked things off. And then, of course, it's grown so much since then. And Jake Hornigay over at the Westgate used to be at the Imperial Palace. Everybody would line up. Uh, the Tuesday, there, there wasn't always a bye week, but there was like the t- first Tuesday before the bye week where everybody knew, okay, run to the Imperial Palace and get that 15-page packet from Jay Cordegay. And he was the one. He was the guy that put it out. So I got to know both of those guys. Um, but Esposito, Manteras, the Las Vegas Hilton, now the Westgate, was the one that got the ball rolling with that fridge prop And what was that, January of 86. And I know exactly where I was. The place is still there, the Four Kegs West. And uh, I was there with some guys from Steubenville and Youngstown. And I think Dustin, I, I think you'd be proud of this. I'm pretty sure we drank the kegs dry that day. But <laughs> so so when, the, when the prop comes out, when, when, they, when they release this and it becomes this big thing, where does, like, the Sharp community view it? Oh, when the props first come out? Yeah, yeah like, like, not right now, but, like, back yeah. then. But oh, like, back then? What was the perception like? Were you hesitant? Were you like, wait, we have to find a way to get down on this right away it's funny because there were sharps and squares so to speak but nobody talked about it back then seriously but when it came, when that prop came out it was like it was more of a wow it's a novelty this is a cool thing more than it was hey man we got to get got to get down on this now before the public moves it or we got to wait and see whether they take it because it's probably gonna we're gonna get a better price on this if we wait i, I don't even remember from a um a sharps public standpoint that game even of that prop ever being talked about back then it, it was so naive back then huh. and, mm. and when it came to that prop i mean again i don't remember if somebody said well i got to get down on the eight props that they have out right now including this one uh because man we're going to get the best of it now the value's there now by the time these guys come in and move it it's going to be no more value on the prop i like i that talk never happened back then at least that i know of i was you know i was doing the start show back then so i would have heard it a little bit more i just i i don't know what it, the betting community was like now but my Initial thought would be like skepticism from you guys. Like oh that yeah, I mean, thought. there, was, there was that. It was like they're only putting it up there because they're going to win more than they're yeah, going to yeah, lose. Yeah. Which so, <laughs> so that, does it immediately like the next year grow from there, or or is it like a slow like snowball every few years, yeah. bigger and bigger, and then now it's just out of control. I'm all walked in with the Westgate packet. It's in uh, my bag. It's literally like 20 pages. That's Jay Cordegay, man. <laughs> he was the guy that really started doing the big packets. I would say. That was 86, the Bears fridge prop. So I'm going to say it was early 90s when I really started seeing the big jump. You know, there was a little bit more every year. And then, like I said, when Jay Cornegay was at Imperial Palace, which is where the link sits now, uh, that's where everybody went, man. And you'd see your buddies that you hadn't seen in a month. Hey, this guy. Hey, that guy. Hey, how's it going? And everybody's down there, including myself, grabbing that packet before anybody can do anything with it. So it was a slow growth. Until around, I'm going to say, nine, early 90s is when it really took off at the IP. As far as a market, I would say right now, especially amongst younger betters, because the NBA is such a player-driven league anyway, I think just individual player props have become so popular amongst younger betters just because that's how they pull for the game. That's how they watch the game now. Yep. When we're talking about betting props – a Super Bowl where you have 15-page prop layouts. Like, what's your approach, Scott? Well, first of all, you're right about the younger crowd. Like, I had a, I don't have a lot of props every day. I had one last night, and I had more people interested in that than I did on the NBA sides and totals was the prop play, which yeah. fortunately cashed by a whopping half an assist with Nurkic. 
<laughs> going over three and a half. <laughs> but uh, uh, my, my thing has always been, or at least since I really started diving into props 30 years ago, has been to make sure to play props that can win no matter what side is winning the football game. And I learned that the hard way, as a lot of us do, man. It's like, you know, if I love Team A and I make all my props based on the fact that I think Team A is going to win the football game and I'm wrong, I've just cost myself a whole lot of money when it comes to the props. So I, that's what I basically look for, props that can happen, legitimately happen, no matter who is winning that football game. You're not a good example because you're entrenched in this every day. But for people that might be coming to town or going to a sports book in their local area, there's so many options. Mm -hmm. How do you start to decipher? Because a couple of props that I've come up with, it took a little bit of time to be able to research it. Are there things that maybe people can look for just at that surface level without having the time to be able to really dig deep into it? You could go back and look at how, you know, just how the Super Bowls have gone for the last many, many years, couple of decades, and see, you know, that in the first six and a half, seven minutes, teams don't really score a lot of points, things like that. And I tell people that are coming in and they want little entertainment value, you know, look at these things that just continue to happen over time, almost year after year, and give your, yourself a chance to, to bet on something that's proven. Doesn't mean it's automatically going to win, but you've got history behind it and as we talked about this a few weeks ago about i'm into human conditioning all that kind of stuff you know there's going to be some nerves in the first seven or eight minutes of a game maybe not from the kansas city side with mahomes and reed but when you get two teams that haven't really been there much not this super bowl you're going to have that nerve situation coming into play in that first quarter feel each other out you know and that might not be a play this this time because you got Mahomes and Reed and that football team for KC, who most of them most of them have been to several Super Bowls now over the last few years. And on the other sideline, you've got a guy in Shanahan who game plans, you know, the first couple of possessions better than anybody in the league. So that might not be a great play this year, but normally that's not a bad play. Look for those things, you know, the safety issue. We've seen a couple lately, but the safeties don't usually happen. And and so I tell people, you know, check those out. And if they're not too pricey for you and you can afford to lose, go ahead and have fun. Yes, yeah, safeties this year, yes, 10 to 1, no minus 2,000. Nine in total, so about 15.8% of the time. One every, one safety every 6.3 Super Bowls, just to give you an idea. So if you don't mind, we're going to keep you for the full hour because sure. this information is just too good. So why don't we start here, and then maybe on the other side we can come back and give a few props that you have. Just the pricing of the game itself and where you set the number. We had Randy Cross, who I'm sure you know very well, of sure. San Francisco 49er legend. He said he had it off about five points. Wow. He, he would have made he would have made the other way. Now it's minus two 49ers. He would have said, I would have made the Chiefs a three-point favorite. Now he's not a sports better, but that's just an opinion. An advanced hypothetical line was three, you know, San Francisco. So, unfortunately, I was already influenced by that, that thought about them already being there. And, you know, it's funny because I hear people all the time saying, you know, that the, they set a, a great line and they say it for the wrong reason. Just because the books set a really good line for the books and they're not going to get cooked on this game at two because it's basically settled at two. A couple of books have gone a little bit off of that over the last few days, but just because they set a great line for themselves doesn't mean there's a great play in this game. You know, and I think people get too confused if, well, I don't like the game because the line's right where it should be. Well, the line's where it should be for the books doesn't mean there's not an advantage to one side or the other, and I tell people all the time, you know, that kind of stuff, but it's basically because I was influenced by hearing what the hypothetical line was going to be a few weeks ago of three, uh, that's why I had no problem with seeing San Francisco where it was being the two-point favorite right now. Are sometimes books too steadfast in their position? I mean, like, they've had the Niners as a power-rated team all year long, but if you look at guys over the last six, seven weeks, it's hard to make an argument that San Francisco is the best team in the NFL. Especially when you watch their last two playoff games. Yeah, exactly. You know, They're like, fortunate to get out of both of them. Absolutely. If uh, if Purdy's uh, turnover-worthy throw against Green Bay is picked off and run back, it was a pick-six waiting to happen. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the player, but he dropped the ball. We wouldn't be, even be talking about the Niners right now. So I, I think that recency bias, you would think, maybe would lean towards – maybe making San Francisco even less yeah. of a favorite. But since they were talking about a hypoth hypothetical line of three, they couldn't do too much uh, with it. So, you know, course of the season, San Francisco is the definite favorite. Course of the postseason, not so much. So I agree with you. Yeah, you mentioned turnover-worthy plays. So Mahomes in the postseason's got zero. Yeah. And Purdy, when you look into the advanced analytics, a ton. Now, he just had the one pick against the Lions and no picks against Green Bay, but, you know, dropped interceptions and what advanced 
number runners call turnover worthy plays. Purdy's been up there. So that is exactly what Scott is referencing. And Purdy, seven picks over his last eight games overall. But we did mention the drops in Mahomes. He's just not going to make mistakes. So when we come back, Scott's going to stick around, have a few props for you. We'll get a thought on the total as well. It sits 47 and a half pretty much at every book right now. Okay. It's VEASAN Super Week, and we're thrilled to be here just four days out from Super Bowl 58. Scott Spritzer, professional handicapper, joining us there at the D. Of course, Doc Sports for the plays, and Scott wins on Twitter. We were talking about the props, so let's get into the props and some that you played. Maybe you want to talk about the use check bet oh. that you've missed out on here. Let's get to it. Yeah, use check. Those who got him last week. The over under, the, excuse me, not the over under, but the the longest reception by Uzcheck was one and a half yards, and which was a fantastic play. Uh, he's minus a buck eighty just to catch a pass, so you could do yourself a favor if you could have got that one and a half and played over, and it's a better bet. He's averaged about ten yards per catch over his last almost seventy receptions, so you got that going for you. And when these teams met in the Super Bowl in twenty twenty. Uh, you can look it up. You'll recall that Juszczyk finished with the second most receiving yards on his team in that game. He had a long of 15 in that game. His other two receptions averaged 12 yards per grab, so 39 yards on three catches, and he's averaged over 16 receiving yards per catch in the postseason. So I thought that was great. Well, that was great. It's now four and a half, the over-under. I still think it's not bad at minus a buck 15, uh, but obviously it's not as juicy as it was uh, last week when you could have had one and a half. That was my favorite prop at that point. Uh, but a couple of, you know, props, if you want to start with that, that kind of relate yeah. to each other. Um, Rashi Rice, I think under six and a half uh, receptions at minus a buck five at last check uh, is not a bad way to go. And maybe even under 66 and a half receiving yards. Here's the thing. They don't need him to make eight or nine grabs uh, and, and, and catch for 70 yards receiving to win this football game. Last game, Mahomes was 30 for 39 through the air, targeted Rice nine times. They connected eight of those nine times. That's unusual also. 30 completions and 39 attempts and hitting eight of nine to Rice came against a Ravens team that looked overwhelmed. The defense did eventually, even though they gave up only 17 points because they, I think they had to be, their heads were spinning over their offensive game plan being so weird. I think it'll, I'll be shocked if he tops these numbers against San Francisco. The Niners are fifth in the league. Uh, allowing just 5.9 yards per pass. And the one thing about San Francisco's defense is they really hone in on the top wide receiver of their opponents. That would be Rasheed Rice in this. And, of course, he doesn't have a lot of help when it comes to wide receivers getting downfield. They're not a downfield passing team either. So the relatable part is that Mahomes has that interception prop of 0 0.5 with the under being minus $1.20. He threw 39 passes against Baltimore. I think he had one or two, two at the most. It was one or two passes that went farther than 20 yards downfield. Call him a game manager all of a sudden. And what's wrong with being a game manager? He's managing the team he has now, not the team he had yet last year or two years ago, and he's doing a great job. So 17 playoff games for Mahomes, zero picks in his last six, 1.7% turnover-worthy rate in those 17 games, which is fantastic. He doesn't have multiple reliable deep threats. We just talked about that. Throws underneath, we talked about that. And he's game-managed these playoffs as well as anybody could ever expect. I thought under zero and a half interceptions is a good play on Mahomes and kind of tied in with what I mentioned about Rasheed Rice. I, Patrick, I love that play. That's one of my props, Mahomes. No INT, it was at even money. But the thing is, you look at his career in the postseason, he's thrown interceptions only in four games. Yep. I mean, throughout the tenure of his entire postseason career, he's been outstanding. And the two Super Bowl wins during those entire postseasons, he never threw an interception. And you talked about it earlier with the um, expectation in terms of turnover at margin with Brock Purdy compared to Mahomes. You just don't see too many. The, the, the other advantage you have on that play is, yeah, it could be a Hail Mary at the end of the half. You can get burned on. But the guy's still got to catch the ball from the defensive side. How many times a game do we see a ball thrown and it hits the guy in the wrong spot right in the hands and they still drop it? Rasheed Rice under. Okay. I'm thirsty for more, Scott. What else you got in the prop market? Oh, let's see. Let's go with um, McCaffrey over 34 and a half receiving yards, which as of this morning was a buck fit minus a buck 15 on the over uh, Kansas City. They maybe they make some adjustments to be better at covering the running back out of the backfield when it comes to throwing and receiving the football. Maybe they do make adjustments, but I don't think Andy Reid goes too far away from what got him to that game. And 
uh, that could make them susceptible if they make those changes to worry about McCaffrey to deep passes. So I don't think they're going to want to do that uh, too much, if at all. They got here by allowing running backs their chances to catch the football. That's how they got here, by avoiding deep passes. And so I think they stick with the, dur the girl that brought them to the dance and they play that defense again. Um, this means McCaffrey, Juszczyk, they're going to face the NFL's third worst defense in receiving yards allowed to running backs over the last 13 games. I'll say it again, Casey's defense, third worst over the last 13 games when it comes to receiving yards allowed to opposing running backs. I think McCaffrey over 34 and a half receiving yards is the way to go there. Beautiful, beautiful and good stat on the D. Okay, now the side in total, again, it's two right now with San Francisco laying it and 47 and a half. It, it, we were talking a little bit and joking a little bit during the break. Uh, <laughs> tough one to handicap, but have you finalized as far as the side or the total here, Scott? Well, yeah, I mean, if you like San Francisco, and I mean, the, the smartest play percentage-wise, I'm not arguing sharp, squares, public, respected money, anything like that. If you're just looking at the math of it all, San Francisco on the money line is the smartest play. You got a 52% okay. chance of winning according to that point spread if you want to do it that way and take everything else out of the mix. Uh, one of the biggest differences in Kansas City's postseason as opposed to regular season has been their percentage of positively graded plays, which is nearly 7% better than it was the first 17 games of the season. Uh, Reed has made Kelsey more important the last couple of the games, as crazy as that sounds, and Mahomes has made no mistakes. Now, listen, you can dive in to PFF, Pro Football Focus, and find these numbers. Uh, these aren't things that I have stored in the back of my head for 17 weeks, but you can surf and you can find the stuff on Pro Football Focus for those who want to handicap some of this themselves. I broke it down by units, guys. Quarterback, Mahomes, obviously, running backs. I give it to CMC in the San Francisco running back uh, situation. I like Pacheco a lot. I love this guy. Uh, but he doesn't catch passes out of the backfield. That's why CMC uh, gives them the lead. Tight ends, even for the most part. Wide receivers, San Francisco with Debo and Ayuk. Casey with Rice. Give that to San Francisco. Offensive line, Tooney's supposed to be back. That puts me on the Chiefs as far as offensive line. The San Francisco, I got this off of PFF, the San Francisco offensive line is 23rd in the NFL this season in pass blocking efficiency. Uh, Trent Williams is their lead guy, of course, up front. They don't have a whole lot else. Defensive line, that belongs to San Francisco. Big fan of Chris Jones, but not having um, Omanihu. Uh, with him being hurt, is a big blow to this team at this point. He's been out for a while. You got Warner and Greenlaw linebacker. No offense to Kansas City's solid linebackers, but that goes to San Francisco. And DBs, the Chiefs are better. The quarters are better. And if San Francisco is forced into nickel more than normal, they're going to struggle. They got a guy, I'm trying to think of his name now, Thomas, in the, in the backfield. If he's forced to play a lot of plays in the nickel, they're going to be beat up pretty bad. This is all good stuff that you can find at PFF, folks. It's not just coming out of my brain. Some of it is. Some of it's just research. Uh, the biggest issue with San Francisco for me is the advantage of quarterback. That's the one I'm having a hard time getting past. Mahomes is an underdog, 9-3, 33 points per game, 37 touchdowns, 10 picks in those 12 games, and a passer rate of almost 114. 3-0 and as a playoff underdog, I can't get past that, guys. That's what's making me lean towards KC. I just think at some point you're going to see that situation where Purdy doesn't get away with turnover-worthy plays like he has thus far. Great breakdown. Tremendous. And then do you just, as far as the 47 and a half, do you have a quick thought on the pacing here? As far as I think it's going to go over. I know a lot of guys like the under. I think it's going over. I really do. I think with what I was talking about with how Kansas City passes the football underneath, you can beat San Francisco potentially that way. And the fact that I think they are going to, San Francisco, be able to throw the ball underneath to the running backs unless KC makes adjustments throughout the course of the game. If they do, they can get burned be uh, deep uh, by Debo, by Ayuk. And so I think for those reasons, this game does go over the total. And, you know, let's not forget that also San Francisco benefited from a first-year starter who threw two picks and the last year against a defense that was bad all year long. Detroit. So there you go. <laughs> Want an edge for betting the Super Bowl? Click the link in the description to download VSIN's free betting guide. 